firms that don't have a plan are at a competitive disadvantage. This is episode 62. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is your host of the Business of Architecture show, Enoch Bartlett-Sears. And today we're going to continue talking with Ray Kogan. He is the president of Kogan & Company, specializes in strategic planning for architecture and engineering firms. And Ray also co-authored the book, Strategic Planning for Design Firms. So I definitely recommend... I have a copy of it right here. Beautiful. Looks very familiar. I recommend that you pick up a copy of that book to get further information about what we're talking about today. And just want to mention that today's show is sponsored by the Business of Architecture Conference, a conference specifically tailored towards smaller firms and sole practitioners to deal with the issues that we as small practitioners deal with, how to find more clients, how to make sure that we can pick and choose the projects we want to work on, how to start up an architecture firm, and how to do alternate forms of project delivery like design, build, and architect as developer. So, Ray, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Ina. Pleasure to be here. Now, in our last segment, we promised our listeners a sort of checklist that they could use to go through their own strategic planning process to sort of map out where they want to be. Yes, yes. In in the previous episode, we talked about uh, conducting interviews, uh, learning what uh, a firm's uh, aspirations are, uh, learning what works and what doesn't work in the firm, what are the kind of of, uh, issues that could help it get to its vision and those that could keep it from getting there and and having some kind of a retreat. We didn't talk very much about the retreat. But when you talk about a checklist, what I imagine, Enoch, is what are the major components of a strategic plan? What should you have in a strategic plan? Uh, And and I equate a strategic plan, as, as an architect myself, to a design project. And in fact, I, I give uh, seminars and webinars uh, uh, talking about designing the future of your firm because I think that architects can relate to that very well. So when you design a project, you start with the big picture, right? When you work with an, a client on a project, you need to know what their program is before you even ever start designing. Uh, and you need to know what they really want in the future. And that's, that's really the biggest picture, the conceptual part of a strategic plan, uh, the mission of an architecture firm, why is it in business in the first place? If they're interested in the business of architecture, why are they in business? And their vision, what do they want to be when they grow up, if you will? And in the earlier segment, we talked about that being maybe a five-year horizon. So I equate that kind of to schematics in a, in a project. You're not down into the details. You're not designing flashing details. You're not doing door and hardware schedules. You're not selecting colors. You're dealing at the big picture conceptual level. And that's really what a firm's vision for the future is all about. But in an architectural project, you have to get into more detail. You have to get into effectively design development, DDs. So, you know, in DDs, you start selecting some basic building systems. You include engineers more than you did earlier on. Uh, You're making those kind of more detailed decisions. And so it is in strategic plan. Uh, A five-year vision is fine, but what about something nearer term than that? Are there any kind of measurable, quantifiable goals that we can set for ourselves? Five years is a long time. What about next year and the year after that? Maybe three years out, where do we want to be? And you can measure and set goals for almost anything, not just things that have a dollar sign in front of them or a percent sign after them, but you know, almost anything. How much of this type of work do we want to do? How many people do we want to have? All kinds of things. Uh, And you develop strategies, the namesake of strategic planning. Strategies are the good ideas that address those issues that you identified earlier on, the things that could either keep you from getting to your vision or or help you get there. What are the things that push us in the right direction? Uh, what What are the things that our firm needs to do more of that we haven't been doing enough of? What do we need to start doing that we've never done before? Maybe even, what do we need to stop doing that's been counterproductive for us? So those are good ideas. Kind of like DDs are not quite enough to build a project from, but they certainly are more detailed than schematics. So you get into a project, an architectural project, ultimately you have to do construction documents. You do have to do those flashing details. You do have to tell a contractor what door and hardware to use and innumerable other things too. 
And in strategic planning, you got to get down to the, the nuts and bolts of what I call action plans. Action plans are the shortest term element in a strategic plan. Over the next 12 months, the next year, who's going to do what tasks by what dates to move the firm one step at a time toward uh, achieving those strategies and ultimately realizing its, its vision. So, so just like in an architectural project, you start with a big picture and you work your way down to the details. So it is in strategic planning. You start at a conceptual level and ultimately you get down to what is each person in the firm or at least in the leadership or management of a firm going to undertake and by what deadlines, because we're also very deadline driven in our profession, to move the firm very deliberately, very intentionally along the road, we used the roadmap metaphor when we spoke earlier, along the road toward that vision, the destination at the end of the roadmap. So, so to me, that's the checklist. It's mission and vision, it's goals, strategies, action plans, and then finally, what are you going to do with the plan when you're done? How are you going to make sure that everybody implements it, that everybody does what they promised that they were going to do, knowing that there are clients and projects and problems out there in the real world that are going to take a lot of time. And how are we going to make sure everyone in the firm is on board with this plan and feels good about it and feels bought into it? Ray, which part of this process do you find is most difficult for architects to complete or to participate in or to come up with some, some good plans for? That's a surprisingly easy question. The implementation. The implementation. Uh, I think in the previous segment I mentioned that in my observation, having done this for, for 20 years or so, uh, architecture firms tend to overplan and underimplement. And I think that's because that maybe we, by our nature, uh, uh, I don't want to say we're dreamers, but I would say that maybe we are visionaries, uh, architects by training, by, by predisposition. So, so we can plan big. And in the course of a couple of days of a planning retreat, we can come up with lots of great ideas. And then, of course, we tend to bite off more than we can chew. And in, in firms, arguably, projects come first, clients come first. So it's very, very easy once you get out of the strategic planning retreat. You've got the plan. It's you know a slim, user-friendly document. If it's more than six or eight pages long, it's, it's too involved. But even that starts to take a back seat to project deadlines, client demands, field problems, proposals, all staff issues in your firm, all kinds of things. So the implementation is the stumbling block that I see most frequently among firms. And what is the solution or solutions to that problem? Mm. You know, when I first started doing this 20 years ago, I thought then that the more action items a firm had, the better, which now sounds so horribly naive. But I thought I would leave those retreats and I'd shake hands with everybody and everybody would be very enthusiastic. And I would think that firm is going to be so great when they get all that stuff done. And over the years, I've come to take more of a Miesian approach. The less is more. So I believe that that the tricky part is for a firm to prioritize what it needs to deal with. The, the things that will really change the firm for the better, that will affect the most positive change, the things that will really move the needle. And, and I think that prioritizing and having less in the plan but more impactful material in the plan is the way to go. So that's step number one is don't overdevelop the plan. Step number two is set up some sort of structure after the retreat so the people who are responsible for implementing the plan have a means to do it. They're not just left to do things on their own. And typically what I find works best is for the, the head of the firm, the managing principal, managing partner, whatever that might be, who will probably have a team of individuals with whom he or she develop the plan to hold regular brief meetings, making sure that everybody is on target with their action items, holding their feet to the fire, admittedly, because accountability is important, but also being supportive and understanding and making sure that even when things slip, they don't slip too far. I have a, a rule that I kind of like to recommend that I call my two-strike rule, not three-strike. It's not, not Major League Baseball, two-strike. So let's just say that you, Enoch, you know, have an action item related to the strategic plan. You were in the retreat, in the workshop when it was developed. You raised your hand and volunteered for it, and it's due this month, May of 2014. So if I'm the managing partner, 
Uh, we're going through this brief meeting, not to debate the validity of all these action items, but just to check the status. You know, how are you doing on yours right now? And you tell me that you don't have it done in May as you had originally planned. And, and you've got all kinds of good excuses. Not the dog ate my homework, but there, there were RFIs on this project, and I lots of good reasons. That's strike one. You took a swing at it, you missed. So we immediately reschedule it for a date at your agreement. And you say, I'll have it done by July. Okay. July comes around. Enoch, how are you doing on that one action item you had in the strategic plan? Well, you don't have it done, and it's July. Uh, and you've got lots of good excuses. Uh, that's strike two. And when you have oh, what happens at strike two, I'm starting to get scared strike, here. <laughs> strike two, you reassign that action item to somebody else. The theory behind that is if it was important enough to put into the strategic plan in the first place, and if a group, a team, a strategic planning team, thought that it was worthy of being a high impact enough item to make it into the plan, then it's worth doing no matter who does it. So, so after strike two, you reassign it to somebody else and you're more likely, you the firm are more likely to get it done. No offense to you, it's nothing personal. It's just, if this is important enough to the firm, it's more important than who does it. So that's, you put together a little system like that. It's not infallible. People are people, events happen, things happen, we all know that. But the more structure you put into place, the more assurance there is that things will get done. Okay, so just to summarize, you mentioned to less is more, focusing on the things that are most impactful, prioritizing, and then you implemented um, a particular strategy, a tactic for encouraging accountability and making sure that things get done so that they don't yes. slip. Yes, very good, very well summarized, thank you. When you talk about impactful, let's can you help me um, give me a couple examples of things that might be prioritized as more impactful as opposed to other things that are less impactful? Oh, sure. Um, you know, you get into these strategic planning retreats, and again, they're typically one, one and a half, more often two-day affairs, and, um, and it's easy for the people in these retreats to get down in the weeds and start talking about real details. And, and, it's, and it's a challenge sometimes to lift the discussion back up to some sort of strategic level. Again, the big things that'll, that'll, as I say, move the needle, change the firm for the better. So oftentimes, uh, if you're in a strategic plan and you start talking about an individual in the firm, an employee in the firm, that's a signal that you're not dealing with high impact stuff. The exception to that would be, oh, it's a principle in the firm that is somehow causing a problem or not doing what he or she is supposed to do or, or something like that. That would be the exception. But typically when individual names get mentioned in a strategic plan or in the retreat, you're not dealing with high impact stuff. You have to think about all of this in the context of the vision. If the very first thing you do is establish this vision, remember the conceptual design, just like a client's schematics, if, if you're talking about things that really wouldn't have that much of an impact on what the client wants, what their program is, you're dealing in details that are probably distracting you from the big stuff. So in a strategic plan, oh, the issues that come up most often are markets. What markets should we be in? How do we do our marketing and business development? Um, these days, uh, staffing related issues are becoming more and more critical. The economy is warming up. Uh, it used to be not too many years ago that firms had more staff than they had work and were asking themselves, what are we going to do with all these people? Now they've cut back. Many firms have cut back. They're, they're uh, getting an influx of work and they're starting to ask themselves, how are we going to get all this work done? We don't have enough people. So staffing related issues, recruiting, retention, development of staff, um, skills, that's a very, very common issue. Leadership succession and ownership transition are big ticket items, and I don't mean big cost items. I mean those are impactful things that affect the future of a firm, uh, especially, again, now where we have a lot of firms that are largely owned by aging baby boomers uh, who can see the light at the end of the tunnel with respect to their own careers, and they, they look over their shoulders and Maybe they've done a good job developing and grooming their successors. Uh, maybe they haven't done that. Maybe they've been holding things too close to the vest and 
what they have behind them as a bunch of good project managers. I see that a lot. So those are all high impact issues that oftentimes need to be dealt with in, in strategic plans. Okay. In terms of succession, uh, I know we talked about this a little bit before, Ray, but do you have any suggestions for sole practitioners who are looking at maybe a 10 to 15 year horizon of actually wanting to do a, a sort of a soft retirement? Some ideas for how to, you know, how to evaluate their firm or how to find partners or how to step out of the firm while still have the firm continue on after they leave? Well, you know, that's a trick question. Yeah, and, I, yeah. and I know you didn't mean for it to be a trick question, but it is a trick question in that um, if one is a sole practitioner, how could you softly step into retirement? What would happen to any firm if, if in fact, the sole practitioner stops practicing? Um, but, but there's an answer to even to a trick question, and that is everyone needs a successor. If what you want is for your firm to essentially outlive you or outlive your own personal career, you need somebody to do what you are doing. So even a sole practitioner would need to bring someone into the firm, so all of a sudden you're not a sole practitioner anymore, and you mentor that individual, and you develop them, and arguably you need to develop them into somebody who's even better than you are. Um, it's The world is a difficult place. It's not easier now to run an architectural practice. It's more difficult than ever. That's why you have the business of architecture. So I think that successors to today's firm leaders need to be better in, in every way. Smarter, quicker, more entrepreneurial, uh, more well-rounded. Uh, it's, it's a real challenge running, running a firm these days. Small firm, large firm, it doesn't matter. So that mentorship having somebody to shadow you, to come to meetings with you, to learn what you learn, ultimately to, to ultimately to exceed your capabilities. I think that's the way you get a firm to outlive its sole practitioner. That same concept is true for larger firms where there are multiple principals. Each one of those principals, hopefully in different phases of their careers, needs to have someone or multiple people behind them whom they are mentoring and teaching and training to do their job only better. Mm. Mm, thank think about, you. You think about any firm that has been around through multiple generations, any architecture firm, engineering firm, law firm, they all do this. They all do this. Mm -hmm. It's it's the only way to perpetuate a firm. Ray, in your work with architecture firms, could you have any examples that you can give us of how firms went approaching a new market? Maybe an example of of you know that kind of scenario where they want to maybe break into something, or maybe they have a little bit of experience in this area, or they see an opportunity and they want to enter that strategically? Yes. Yeah, actually, one pops to mind right away. Um, in our earlier segment, we talked about the value that an architecture firm can bring to clients through focused expertise in a market, really understanding the ins and outs of a market. Uh, we use the phrase thought leadership. Um, and, and I, I said that uh, uh, Art Gensler, the founder of Gensler, once described it as knowing more about a client's business than they do. So, so I think that uh, the way to get into a market or to broaden into adjacent multiple markets is, is to extend that expertise. So I'm thinking of a firm, a client of mine that's been a, a client for a long time, that um, started out doing uh, single family residential, but not custom not, not a house for you or a house for me, but builder housing uh, for large-scale regional and national home builders. And they really knew that market very, very well. But of course, that market has severe ups and downs. So they realized, well, what we know is housing design. What we need to do is get into a market that isn't subject to the same fluctuations and volatility as single-family housing. So... It turns out that multifamily housing, specifically multifamily rental housing, also is cyclical, but inversely cyclical to single family. In other words, <clears throat> when mortgage rates get too high and people can't afford to borrow money and they can't afford to buy a house, they've got to live somewhere. They're not living in refrigerator boxes under the overpass, so they go and rent apartments because people have to live somewhere. Um, so when the single family market is down, the multifamily market is up. 
they go they go like this. Not perfectly like that, but they are almost counter cyclical. And yet the skill sets are very similar. Even some of the clients are very similar that builds single family and multifamily developers. So they did that. Then they said, well, even those two markets still have pretty high fluctuations between their highs and lows. So they said, elderly housing. And, and we all know, again, as I referred to earlier, there are a lot of aging baby boomers. The elderly housing market is, is largely demographically driven. And we have an aging population in the US. So they thought elderly housing would be a stable market that would still be able to utilize their design skills in residential design uh, and multifamily residential design, but for a target market that is different and more stable and maybe has a good long-term future. So they decided to make an acquisition of a small firm that did elderly housing design. So now, here they are today, no longer with all their eggs in one basket, single-family builder housing. They've got single-family builder housing, they've got a very robust multifamily practice, and they're into elderly housing, just getting into elderly housing. I like it. It's strategic diversification. Excellent. So, and do you have any other any other stories, Ray? I know we talked about this previously, or, or case studies that you can share about this process, about how strategic planning has contributed to uh, the success of a firm or a creative solution in terms of business? Hmm. Well, you know, almost every firm that goes through strategic planning goes through the, the quote, checklist that we described earlier of those different components of a plan. I would argue it's not a strategic plan if it's missing one of those components. You can't very well skip from schematics to CDs without going through some intermediate phase, and you certainly can't do them in the reverse order. So, so the process is pretty well just prescribed the content of it is different firm to firm. Every single firm has their own aspirations, their own vision for the future, and their own means of getting there, the things that help them or don't help them to get there. So as I think about your question, I think, well, geez, pretty much every firm has, there's a story behind every firm. Every firm has markets it should be in and doesn't want to be in. Every firm has staffing issues, leadership issues, um, some firms have technology issues. Some firms are struggling these days with various project delivery uh, permutations. Uh, you mentioned design build in, in the introduction that your program does that. Uh, of course, um, IPD and, and other things too. Dealing with technologies, small firms especially tend to be struggling these days with advanced design and production technologies like BIM. So, you know, there are all kinds of stories Honestly, it's hard to come up with a story because literally every client I work with has their own their own story. Yeah, no, no, I understand. It's absolutely individualized. And I think the the example you gave of the firm that sort of counterbalanced the different cycles, you know, that, that was a um, useful way to think about how this process works. You know, as, as you were speaking there, it did occur to me, I, I do have a, a relatively recent um, story. Uh, most of my firms tend to be uh, larger firms, but this was a smaller firm. This was a 12-person architecture firm uh, in its second generation. In other words, the, the principal and sole owner of the firm uh, took over the firm from his father, which is it's kind of a nice story, architect, architect, right? Um, and in the process of going through the strategic planning and in my interviewing people and asking them questions about the firm, uh, and in this particular firm, I actually spoke with everyone in the firm, uh, it became clear that the firm was unlikely to outlive its current principal, who, who was in his uh, late 50s, I believe turning 60 this year, was unlikely to outlive him just because the culture of the firm was such that he was not sharing financial information, he was not lo loosening up on the reins of he was, he was controlling the firm very, very much. And other people in the firm, rising stars, if you will, were feeling frustrated by this. And they were likely to be the future leaders of the firm. Uh, he didn't have a son or daughter that, that was going to be going into this business. So, so the process was a real light bulb going on for him 
when he understood what people thought of in, thought in the firm. Um, he was leading a pretty insular professional life before this, but the strategic planning process really enlightened him. And, and I saw a real 180 degree turnaround. More important than me seeing it, the other people in the firm saw the change, saw him realize that he needed to, he needed to come around if, he, if the firm was going to keep going and if they were going to have a place in the firm. And, and I, I thought it was very gratifying. I thought that there was a lot of promise there where prior to going through strategic planning, I think they probably would have, he would have lost some key people and ultimately just played, closed and locked the door behind him, which is not what anyone would have wanted. Excellent. Well, Ray, thank you for sharing that. And I can see how that is interesting. It, do you see those kind of changes happen fairly frequently in terms of people actually changing the way they operate? Well, you know, it's more possible to have a dramatic change when you're dealing with a smaller entity. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this case, it hinged on one individual. In a larger firm, where you have multiple principals and maybe you've got a president or a managing principal or something and you've got it's it's a little bit harder to turn a larger ship than it is a rowboat right so so the answer is sort of yes and no yes firms change uh, uh, they call it strategic planning for a reason we come up with strategies to improve the firm not change for the sake of change certainly change for the improvement of the firm so every firm changes in some way after having gone through strategic planning. They just don't do quite the about face that this small firm did. Ray, before we end up today, are there any other additional thoughts or, or things about this topic that you would like to share with us? Well, only this. Thanks for asking. Only this. Um, so, you know, I've been doing this for a while, uh, 20, 20 plus years as of, as of now. And, and I guess... I've become a true believer in strategic planning. Uh, I've seen firms uh, in a downward spiral, as that small firm was, uh, pull out of it. Uh, when times are good, I've seen firms that are already doing very well aspire and get to do even better. So I think strategic planning is, is an amazingly powerful and flexible tool for plotting the future of a firm. Maybe sometimes I'm guilty of the hammer and nail syndrome, in other words, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But I, I tend to believe that strategic planning can be a very, very good long-term problem-solving technique. I wish more firms did it. I believe that as our profession and industry become more and more competitive over time, that firms that don't have a plan are at a competitive disadvantage. And that's a great place to end. So don't put yourself at a competitive disadvantage. There you go. Thank you very much, Ray Kogan, president of Kogan & Company. Thank you for joining us on the Business of Architecture show. Thank you, Enoch, very much. And that's a wrap for another show about the Business of Architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.